That evening, as I was preparing dinner, I asked Michael what he wanted to eat. Normally, a child would say something like hamburger or fried chicken, something they like, but Michael seemed somehow uneasy. It wasn't so much that he was hesitant, but more like he was confused by my question. What's the matter? You can tell me your favorite. Grandma will make anything for you. Even after asking him that, he didn't answer, so I felt as if pressing him any further would be like scolding him, so I didn't ask anymore and told him to wait while watching TV in the living room. Somehow, I prepared a menu that seemed child-friendly, and decided it was time to call Michael for dinner. However, even with dinner laid out in front of him, Michael didn't seem to want to sit down at all. What's wrong? Don't you want to eat? At my question, he shook his head vigorously from side to side. Then why? Then, with a puzzled expression, Michael asked me. Grandma, is it okay for me to eat today? At Michael's words, I wondered if my ears were playing tricks on me, and I couldn't help but suspect I was going deaf or hearing things. However, when I asked again to be sure, the response I got from Michael confirmed that I had not misheard. Huh? A day when it's okay to eat? We eat three meals a day, right? When I asked back with another question, Michael suddenly ran out into the garden from the window and started pulling out the grass. Surprised by Michael's sudden action, I held his grass-pulling body and took him back inside the house. Why? What's wrong? Grandma, I'm hungry. You're hungry, right? That's why I prepared it for you, Michael. So why did you start pulling out the grass? Because my mom always says I can't eat unless I help out with something. I couldn't hide my surprise at the unexpected words that came out of Michael's mouth. When I decided to ask for more details, I learned an astonishing truth. When I was 22, I fell in love at first sight with my husband, who had transferred from another region to the company where I was working, and I desperately approached him both at work and privately. Coincidentally, we lived close to each other, and before we knew it, even when our work hours didn't match, we started to meet somewhere and go home together. One day, on a crowded train, he overlapped his body with mine to protect me, and my heartbeat wouldn't stop. In the middle of the crowd, I whispered. Would you go out with me? I clenched the sleeve of his suit tightly, and with eyes that were slightly teary from embarrassment, I confessed. I must have had a sly look on my face at that time. But he blushed at my words and said, I'd love to, Lily. Without minding the eyes of others, we kissed. We started dating smoothly. After that, everything was quick. We started living together shortly after we started dating, got married in the first year, and were blessed with a child. I had always dreamed of getting married and living a happy life since I was a child, and I was overjoyed to be blessed with a child, and we both decided on the name Sam for the child. It was truly a moment of supreme happiness. However, that happiness didn't last long. When Sam was three years old, I found it strange that my husband was always coming home unusually late. I asked a friend who worked at the same company as my husband to investigate for me. It turned out that my husband always left the company at the regular time, and a friend witnessed him disappearing into a hotel with a younger girl from the same department after work. It was then that I first learned that the reason my husband was always coming home late was that he was meeting with that younger woman. It was clear proof of an affair. When I confronted him about the affair with all the evidence, he gave in and admitted to the affair. My happy married life turned out to be just a four-year game of house, and I took Sam and decided to separate from my husband. Becoming a single mother, I desperately balanced work and household chores while raising Sam. Seeing me working hard on chores and jobs, Sam, despite being a child, helped around the house as much as possible, striving to reduce my burden. I fondly remember bursting into tears in front of other parents during an elementary school open class when I heard his composition about his future dream, which was to make it easier for me, his mother. As Sam grew up healthily, he eventually reached an age where he showed his maturity by inviting his longtime girlfriend, whom he wanted to marry, to our house. This is Emily. Mom, I've been thinking about marrying Emily. Emily, who was introduced to me, spoke briskly and had a clear and bold personality, which left a good impression on me. Sam, if you say this is the person you've chosen, I won't oppose. She responds briskly, so it's good, right? Really? So, you're giving your blessing for us to get married? Yes. 
In return, make sure to be happy because I doubt you'll find anyone better than her. I know. Emily, let's build a happy family together from now on. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. From my perspective, Sam and Emily seemed to be a good match, so I instinctively approved of their marriage, sending them off to a bright future. Congratulations on your wedding, Sam, Emily. At their wedding, memories of the past were revived, and I was shedding big tears during a moment that was both joyful and embarrassing. One year after the happy occasion, a third beloved family member, Michael, was born to the couple. I was present at Michael's birth, along with Sam, and seeing Michael being born, crying tears of joy, is a memory I cherish. However, the fact that Sam, who loves children, cried more than Emily, who worked hard during the childbirth, was a sight that made me happy as a mother. A few years later, I received a call from Sam. He explained that he would be working alone out of state for a while and asked if I could occasionally check on Emily and Michael. I think it'll be fine, but Michael is reaching an age where he needs more attention, and I'm worried about various things. So, it doesn't have to be every day, but I'd like you to check on them about once a week. I certainly understood Sam's concern. Indeed, Sam was quite a handful as a child, and the moment I took my eyes off him, he would quickly go somewhere. Taking care of a child during their most active and sensitive period is overwhelming for a single woman. Until now, Sam had been taking care of them, and they had managed somehow, but with him going away for work, it's understandable that Sam, who tends to worry, would become anxious. I understand, it's your request, Sam. And I want to see my adorable grandson as well. Relieved, Sam left for his out-of-state assignment, and I started visiting Emily and Michael on weekends. It felt odd going to their house empty-handed. So I packed some snacks that Michael would like and some preserved foods in containers for the two of them. When I rang the doorbell and looked into the camera of the monitor-equipped intercom, Emily appeared at the entrance with noisy footsteps. Uh, Ms. Roberts, what brings you here today? Sam asked me to check on you guys. Oh, I see. It's a bit messy, and I'm sorry, but please come in. I felt a slight discomfort at Emily's momentarily troubled expression, but upon reflection, it's natural to react that way to an almost unannounced visit. When I entered the house, Michael, who was playing with crayons in the living room, greeted me with a smile. I hadn't seen Michael for a while, and as expected, he had grown taller. His face, once so adorable that it could be mistaken for a girl's, had now matured into that of a mischievous boy. Here, I brought some snacks and made some preserved dishes. Feel free to eat them. Wow, I'm sorry. Sam really worries too much. Please make yourself comfortable today. At Emily's suggestion, I enjoyed playing board games and card games with Michael, and watching his favorite anime, making the most of our reunion. In the evening, we filled the dining table with the preserved dishes I brought and the food Emily and I cooked together, and had dinner. As the three of us started having dinner, I felt a slight oddness in the way Michael voraciously dug into the prepared meal. It was as if the images of hungry children I see on educational programs during lunchtime, from overseas, somehow overlapped with what I was seeing. However, that is limited to the foreign orphans, as Michael has a proper mother, Emily. It's impossible to think that he hasn't been fed properly. Michael, you don't have to eat so fast, no one is going to take it away from you. I encouraged him to eat slowly as he desperately dug into his meal, but it seemed as if my words fell on deaf ears as he continued to be engrossed with the food in front of him. Michael has been going through a growth spurt recently, and he always eats like this. I guess my discipline is lacking, I apologize. Oh, it's a growth spurt. Well, it's that age where you have to eat a lot to grow big and strong, right? Convinced by the growth spurt explanation, I moved some side dishes from my plate to Michael's. After finishing dinner and cleaning up while chatting with Emily, I played a little more with Michael before it was time for my bus home. I decided to go home that day. Several months later, I received a rare call from Emily. Ms. Roberts, I'm sorry for the sudden request. Actually, Sam seems to have fallen ill while he was out, and I need to go take care of him. Could you look after Michael for a while? I'm completely fine, but is Sam okay? Should I go instead? Thinking that Emily might have her hands full with Michael, I offered to go instead, but she shook her head, 
saying that she couldn't bother me with that, and left Michael in my care. I can understand her feelings of worry about her husband possibly collapsing from ill health in a distant land. Understanding Emily's feelings, I promised to take good care of Michael and decided to leave Sam's care to Emily. Emily probably won't be able to communicate for a while because she will be busy taking care of Sam, so I was strangely told to contact her if anything happened. Although I had some doubts, I thought it might be a sign that she wanted me to fully take over Sam's care, so I saw off Emily, who was heading to Sam's side with Michael. Do you think dad will be okay? I'm sure he'll be fine, don't worry. Your dad has always been strong, even when he caught a cold, he would recover quickly. And your mom will be with him, so there's no need to worry. I reassured a worried Michael and took him to my house. It had been several months since we last met. I felt a bit guilty towards Sam but decided to make the most of this brief time and create happy memories. Michael, when we get to grandma's house, do you want to play with the toys I used to play with when I was little? Being a person who takes good care of things, I had stored toys and board games from my childhood and Sam's as precious memories, and had recently cleaned them up, intending to let Michael play with them when he reached the appropriate age. Really? I want to play! Yay! Relieved to see the worried expression on Michael's face changed to one of joy at the mention of old toys. We arrived at my house, and immediately began playing with the nostalgic pieces and board games, and watching cartoons that Michael wanted to see. Spending a relaxing time together. That night, as I prepared dinner, I asked Michael what he wanted to eat. Ordinarily, a child would mention their favorite food, like hamburgers or fried chicken, but Michael seemed unusually hesitant, looking more confused than reluctant at my question. What's wrong? You can tell me your favorite food, I'll make anything you want. Despite my reassurance, he didn't answer, so, not wanting to pressure him, I told him to wait in the living room and watch TV while I prepared a menu that children usually like. Once everything was ready and laid out on the table, I called Michael for dinner. But he didn't make any move to sit down. What's the matter, don't you want to eat? He shook his head vigorously. Then, why? Then, with a puzzled expression, he asked me. Grandma, is it okay for me to eat today? I was so shocked by Michael's question that I wondered if there was something wrong with my hearing and suspected that I might have misunderstood him. However, when I asked him again, the response I received confirmed that I had not misheard. You're asking if it's okay to eat? We usually eat three meals a day, right? As I asked him again, he suddenly ran out into the garden and started pulling out grass. Surprised by Michael's sudden action, I stopped him, hugging his grass-pulling body, and brought him back inside. Why, why can't I do that? Grandma, I'm hungry. You're hungry, aren't you? That's why I prepared this for you, Michael. So, why did you start weeding? Well, because mom always says that I can't eat unless I help out. I couldn't hide my surprise at the unexpected words that came out of Michael's mouth, so I decided to ask for more details. According to him, after Sam left for his business trip, Emily started forcing Michael to help around the house and be a good boy, or else she wouldn't feed him. So, Michael would wait for Emily to leave and then search for any edible food left in the house, and if there was none, he would wait until she came back. Tears of sadness flowed uncontrollably from my eyes as I listened to my grandson's shocking living conditions and remembered my previous visit to Emily's house. Back then, she had said that he was eating a lot because he was growing, but I realized that it was probably because he hadn't eaten until then. I regretted not noticing the signs earlier and pretending to understand, not realizing Michael's true feelings. I felt a surge of regret, self-reproach, and anger towards Emily. It's okay, Michael. You might not understand now, but your mom is wrong. You don't have to help or be a good boy to eat. You're growing up, after all. I reassured Michael and sat him down again, and we enjoyed a hearty dinner together, followed by watching anime and sharing a watermelon dessert. After making sure Michael had fallen asleep, I texted Sam to update him on the situation and reminded him to contact me as soon as he felt better. I was told by Emily not to contact her unless I reached out first, but I couldn't keep that promise anymore. Soon after texting Sam, he called back. I had thought for sure that Sam's health was so bad that Emily was even managing his phone, but when he got in touch right away, I felt a bit relieved. 
Mom? What's going on? Michael hasn't been fed while I'm away? There's nothing more to it. It's exactly as I texted you. Isn't Emily there with you? Ha, huh, Emily? There's no way she's here with me on my business trip. I told you I was leaving the two of you in your care, didn't I? There was a discrepancy between what Emily had told me and what Sam was saying. Emily said she was going to take care of you on your business trip because you were sick and left Michael with me. Sick? There's no way I'm sick. Besides, if I were, I would have contacted you. Indeed, that made sense. If something had happened, Sam would have definitely contacted me. But this time, there was no communication from him, and I only found out about his supposed illness from Emily. And thinking about it, it was strange that Emily said she couldn't contact us because she was taking care of Sam. It felt like she was trying to keep us at a distance and hide something. Actually, I just remembered that Emily told me not to come home during the long holiday. Do you think? Finally, we both realized that Emily had been lying to us. Moreover, Michael mentioned that Emily had been going out at night, which was news to Sam. As we talked, I could feel Sam's anger towards Emily through the phone. After hearing everything, Sam decided to take a day off and come back home the next day. The following morning, Sam visited my house and greeted Michael at the door. Seeing his son, Sam's eyes welled up with tears as he hugged him tightly. Dad, welcome home. What happened? Michael, I'm sorry for being such a helpless father. It seemed that Sam had already made up his mind after our conversation last night. He was determined to divorce Emily, who had been treating their son so poorly while going out at night. Considering that Emily hadn't been in contact with Sam and was nowhere to be found, it was likely that she was having an affair while Sam was away on his business trip. So, Sam decided to search for evidence at home. Sam searched through Emily's room and the closets at home, where she might have hidden things, but although she had taken precautions regarding physical evidence, it was clear from checking the PC history that she had made a hotel reservation. Since the reservation was only for two people, the possibility arose that she might be staying overnight with her affair partner. That was the only evidence, but it was more than enough to suspect an affair. Based on that evidence, Sam requested a private detective agency to investigate the affair. A week later, unaware that Sam knew everything, Emily contacted me saying, Sam is feeling better, so I will return home tomorrow. I immediately forwarded the message to Sam, who took a leave of absence from work and waited at my house for Emily to come and pick up Michael. Emily, who was unaware of what was about to unfold, came to my house, which was about to become a battleground, with high spirits. Michael, I came to pick you up. Emily made eye contact with Sam, who was showing an angry expression at the door. To prevent Emily from escaping from the scene, I locked the entrance door and led her to the back of the room to have a discussion. I heard everything from Michael. It seems you didn't give him a proper meal while I was away. Sam said, confronting Emily with tremendous anger, to which Emily muttered in a small voice, it was discipline. Angered by her attitude of not making eye contact, Sam presented copies of the hotel reservation for two people found in the PC history and the results of the affair investigation by the private detective agency, and demanded a divorce and custody of Michael. I can't trust you with Michael. When I think about something happening to him, I can't stay calm. Wait a minute. That's too harsh. I didn't do this because I wanted to. So, were you being blackmailed by the other person? Is that why you were having a good time at the hotel with someone you didn't even like? Isn't that too convenient? I had a hard time too. Since you went away, I had to take care of the house and Michael all by myself, and I got tired. Emily explained that she had vented her frustration on Michael and sought solace in an affair because she had to take care of everything alone since Sam went on a work assignment alone. Infuriated by her attempt to gain sympathy, Sam threw several photos of a man on the floor. It turned out that Emily had been going out at night when Sam couldn't come home from work and had been secretly seen talking happily with her boyfriend, which was revealed by Michael. Do you still say the same thing with all this evidence? I'll say it one more time. We're getting a divorce. I'll take custody of Michael. Got it? I don't care anymore. Do whatever you want. 
I'm going to marry the man who loves me, Emily said, throwing Sam's words back at him, and stormed out of my house with her face red with anger after unlocking the door. Michael seemed to stop Emily for a moment, but I gently held him back. Michael looked at me with a questioning face, but I just stared straight into his eyes and shook my head. Daddy, did you and mommy have a fight? Michael, who did not fully understand the situation, looked at Sam with a puzzled expression. Listen, Michael. You may not understand it now, but your dad and mom didn't have a fight. We said goodbye. But from now on, we will live happily together, just the two of us. Okay? Sam, not wanting to cause any more stress or worry to Michael, spoke to him with a smile while patting his head. I could only stand by and watch, but seeing Sam's kindness, I decided to support them as much as possible from behind. Later, additional investigation results from the detective agency revealed that Emily's affair partner was apparently married. Emily believed in her affair partner, but he chose to rebuild his relationship with his wife, leaving her abandoned. Emily tried to mend her relationship with Sam again, but was issued a restraining order by a lawyer, leaving her with no choice but to live alone. Sam, realizing he couldn't leave Michael alone after this incident, changed jobs to full remote work and decided to live together with the three of us in my house. Michael, who was attached to me, was initially confused, but as time went by, he got used to the environment, and now he often knows more about where things are placed in the house than Sam does, and is frequently asked by Sam about the location of things like nail clippers. To make sure Michael doesn't go hungry like before, I try to cook warm, homemade meals every day, and the three of us enjoy our meals while having a pleasant conversation. I don't want Michael to have to gauge people's moods and expressions while hungry anymore. And I hope we never have to see Michael like that again. Hoping that only warm memories of family will remain in Michael's heart, I cook delicious meals every day, watch Michael and Sam stuff their mouths full and fill their stomachs, and feel happiness from the bottom of my heart.